fully remote and virtual meeting of the Asian Studies Forum offered by the Center for Asian Studies. My name is Dennis Kratz. This, I serve as the director of the Center for Asian Studies, and I have three roles this afternoon. The first is to greet you, which I have just done. The second is to introduce this afternoon's speaker, who is me. Uh, and the third is to speak. My remarks this afternoon emerge from a question that I wonder if you've asked yourself, and that is, have you ever wanted to meet and speak with your favorite fictional character? Well, today I get the chance. The second comment that I have is, the one real drawback of a virtual meeting is of course, no food and drink, uh, at least none for us to share together. Uh, I hope we correct that problem and are meeting again soon. My remarks are entitled Odysseus Meets the Monkey King, Journeys East, West, and Beyond. Odysseus, the great teller of tales, thus begins the account of his fabulous adventures on land and sea. There's nothing better than when deep joy holds sway throughout the realm and banqueters up and down the palace sit in ranks enthralled to hear the storyteller perform. And before them all, tables heaped with bread and meats and drawing wine from a serving bowl, the waiters make their rounds and keep the wine cups flowing. This, to my mind, is the best that life can offer. I think Odysseus was right. There are few pleasures of the mind to equal a good story well told. The, basics, the basic idea of a story is elegantly simple. I provide an account of events arranged and presented in a manner to keep you interested, entertained, and perhaps informed. A story can be as concise as just a few sentences or as complex and massive as, for example, the magisterial Indian Mahabharata. Within that basic concept, there's a continuum stretching from scrupulously accurate accounts of remembered events to fictions that are totally invented and even wildly fantastic. In the middle are those that describe something akin to everyday reality. You know, the type they bear the warning, the characters and events in this story are fictitious. Any similarity to real persons, living or dead, is coincidental and not intended by the author. Well, Odysseus in the Odyssey is about to spin a tale that spans that continuum. He claims to be providing an accurate account of his adventures, but only after introducing himself as, quote, known for every kind of trickery, my fame has reached the heavens, end quote. And of course, he's a character in a, fist, in a fictitious tale. So what might be true in the context of that story in any other context is false. Such invented fictions are, for me, among the crown jewels of human achievement. Think of it. Storytellers weave out of words an alternate reality populated by people and beings who never existed and describing events that never happened. We bring those words to life by using them to reimagine what the storyteller first imagined. Even more admirable, if the language of the story is seductive enough and the character is sufficiently attractive in the magnetic sense of the term, and the ideas explored provocative enough, the result is a process that I call collaborative enchantment. By that term, I mean something far more intense than the familiar phrase suspension of disbelief. I mean that we enter that world willingly actively and fully, with both our intellect and our imagination. We weep at a death, we recoil at a threat, we laugh with joy when goodness prevails. While embedded in that fiction, we believe in it. We become part of it. To other human activities that necessarily involve collaborative enchantment, by the way, are religion and being in love. In the words of the novelist Joyce Carol Oates, such story enable us 
to slip involuntarily, often helplessly, into another's skin, another's voice, another's soul, to enter a consciousness not known to us. Great works that evoke this response, and not just stories composed in our own time and our own culture. Encountering the stories of other, even radically different cultures, provides an added dimension to this experience. The Chinese novelist Yu Hua has expressed this idea with eloquence. He wrote, if literature has a mysterious power, it's precisely this, that one can read a book by a writer of a different time, a different country, a different race, a different language, and a different culture, and there encounter a sensation that is precisely our own. Thanks to storytellers, the past remains vibrant, provocative, and present. We can bring its troubles and wisdom to life simply by reading or hearing or watching a story. This afternoon, my subject is two of the most enchanting and influential stories ever told. The Odyssey, composed probably in the late seventh century before the Common Era, by an unknown poet whom we call Homer, and Journey to the West, composed in the late 16th century of the Common Era, possibly or probably, depending whom you ask, by a minor Ming official named Wu Chong'an. Since many of you are probably more familiar with one than the other, here's a very brief introduction to each via the work that made them famous. The Odyssey recounts the adventures of the warrior Odysseus trying to return home to his island kingdom of Ithaca after the Trojan War, a war that he, by the way, had found the perfect trick to bring to an end. That's the famous Trojan horse in the lower right hand of your screen. He's described as Polutropos, a man of many twists and turns, and other words describing mental agility, strategic genius, and the ability to deceive people. After encountering a range of challenges from monsters to seductive divinities, he reaches home for the first time in 20 years. There he slaughters a group of more than 100 men who've been shamelessly eating his food, drinking his wine, and courting his wife. Penelope by name, that's her in the upper right hand corner. The story ends with a lovely artful reunion of Odysseus and Penelope. Now, you may be surprised to see on the screen a third narrative, the Aeneid, composed by the Roman author Virgil in the late first century before the Common Era. This information just might come in handy during the lecture. The Aeneid tells the story of Aeneas, a Trojan prince whom the gods compelled to flee Troy and travel with a small band of survivors to Italy in order for Rome to be founded. The first half, closely modeled on the Odyssey, tells of the hero's wanderings from Troy to Italy. The second half, modeled on the Iliad, describes the war between the newly arrived Trojans and the native Latins. It's among the most influential works of antiquity, responsible in part for the survival of classical literature, and specifically for the tradition of heroic epic poetry through the Christian Middle Ages and the West into today, thanks in part to what Virgil did to transform the concept of heroic valor. The, the journey to the West recounts the journey of the monk Tripitaka, accompanied by an entourage of animal protectors to India to obtain sacred Buddhist texts and bring them back to China. The story initially focuses on one of those guardians, the miraculous birth from a stone egg, outrageous adventures, and eventual punishment by the Buddha of Sun Wukong, king of a small monkey tribe. Sun Wukong, along with the monk, is the focus of the tale. Trapped under a mountain for 500 years, he is released by Tripitaka to take part in the expedition. The narrative combines comedy, 81 different adventures with demons and other dangers, and a multi-layered allegory of human striving toward enlightenment. Well, stories by their very nature become what I call response generators. Stories of abiding interest will attract multiple interpretations and even retellings that expand and expand and extend and sometimes criticize 
the original. Contemporary American examples include the Harry Potter phenomenon and Game of Thrones. My own favorite alternate universe, the one birthed by the original Star Trek television series, may indeed keep going to and past the heat death of the universe. The Odyssey and the Journey to the West are both fertile response generators. Over the centuries, they have evoked radically different assessments of their quality and value. Both have been dismissed as almost juvenile. A recent book says, says of the novel, it's a mishmash of folk tales, poems, and religious matter without much real design. But for most modern scholars and lovers of Chinese literature, the journey represents the culmination of a long and many faceted tradition, as well as a creative synthesis and expansion of ideas that reveals a remarkably firm strength of structure and an extraordinary capacity for organizing such a massive tale. We recognize that the author purposely has also interwoven layers of allegory into the narrative from each of the great Chinese religious traditions, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism. The Odyssey and Journey to the West occupy uniquely important positions respectively in Western and Asian culture. They've been read continuously, studied exhaustively, retold, revised, rewritten, and reimagined in multiple media almost countlessly. Each has inspired novels, graphic novels, movies, stage dramas, operas, video games, and more. Each has also produced a charismatic, captivating central figure. Odysseus, son of Laertes, king of Sparta, and Sun Wukong, sage equal to heaven, the handsome monkey king. These two characters have much in common, mental agility, the ability to deceive people while seeing through the attempts of anybody to deceive them, extraordinary adventures, and last but not least, both spent a, specific, a significant amount of time incarcerated. They also have in common a continuing power to captivate us. It's hard to imagine a way that each hasn't been portrayed, studied, interpreted, except perhaps by letting them speak for themselves, or better yet, by getting to hear a conversation between them. Think of the insights a conversation like that might yield. Well, I did. And so I invited both of them to dinner. Much to my surprise, they both accepted. We agreed to meet a few evenings later at a local restaurant where we could sit outside and talk. It turns out, I should add, that imaginary dinners have their own protocol. Since Odysseus and Sun Wukong are fictional, they exist simultaneously at every stage of their imaginary lives. That circumstance enabled me to invite them at any of those stages I wanted. I invited Wu Kong during the period he was spending as a pilgrim fighting demons and protecting the monk. I invited the Odysseus who has just arrived in Ithaca but hasn't yet slaughtered the suitors and been reunited with his wife. People engaged in incomplete quests, I think, are at their most interesting. It also helps that imaginary participants all speak fluent American English and we don't have to wear masks or observe social distancing. With apologies to Odysseus, I regret the circumstances that prevent us from meeting in person, not to mention from servers bringing you food and keeping your glasses full. There's another constraint. Although I've studied and taught and thought about Odysseus for many years, believe me, I'm no Odysseus. The best that I can offer is the following scrupulously accurate account of my dinner with two of the most remarkable characters of world fiction and perhaps some food for thought. The dinner. It was a cool, almost perfect evening. I arrived first. The patio was empty with the exception of one table in the far corner where a man who looked vaguely familiar sat drinking a glass of wine that appeared to be Chianti. While I waited, it occurred to me that the subject of constraint would provide the most promising topic 
to open the conversation. Sun Wukong, after all, had spent 500 years trapped under a mountain. As for Odysseus, he seems almost enamored of containment, whether in a wooden horse, in a cave, in the clutches of a beautiful nymph on an isolated island, or in disguise. Both he and Wu Kong seem bound, pun intended, to get themselves into trouble so they could exercise their ingenuity to get out of it. Odysseus was the first to arrive. Crazy! No one's ever gonna believe we're a real bank. Oh, it's gonna work. She's got you close enough to talk to her. Taking off the bus got more of a future than marrying some guy named Walter. I've got that bona fide. I got the answers. Everett, my beard itches. In the jailhouse now, fellas. Neighborhood of B. As you can see, as was his wont, he came in disguise. Now, later, the monkey king arrived. Dramatically, as was his wont. was going to be an interesting dinner. So there we sat, and there I was, flanked by royalty, Odysseus, the king of Sparta, and Sun Wukong, king of the monkeys, the sage equal to heaven. To my relief and pleasure, the two immediately struck up a friendship and started sharing stories, no surprise, about their exploits. Since our time together was limited, at the first opportunity, I spoke up. Sun Wukong, I said, the journey to the West says very little about your 500 years under Five Phases Mountain. It must have been dreadful. How could a trickster like you endure the absence of opportunities to disrupt? Sun Wukong smiled, somewhat bemused. Then it's, he said, first, thanks for your invitation. I've always wanted to meet Odysseus. Now to your question. It seems that your travel and studies in Asia have not fully loosened the shackles of your Western mind. I'm referring to the tendency 
to create categories and give them a kind of artificial reality. When you place a unique being like me who fits no existing mold into a preconceived category, you limit what you can see me as. A while ago, I was talking with a version of your philosopher Voltaire about this very matter. Wu Kong, he said, the great misunderstanding that prevails in the West concerning the Chinese arises from our judging your customs by our own, for we carry our prejudices and spirit of contention along with us, even to the extremities of the earth. Trickster, Dennis, is your term. If you place me in that category, you'll find it doesn't fit, and then you'll probably dismiss me as a defective kind of trickster. Think how that demeans the other. Abash, I asked, well, what would be a more fair and instructive way to ask my question? Think of me, he replied, as a repository of boundless energy that compels me to outrageous action. Think of me as representing the audacity of the playful mind. That's, by the way, how I think of my new friend Odysseus. As for disrupting, yes, in my earlier life, I enjoyed disrupting. I look back upon that period now with a period of pleasure and embarrassment. Now that I'm protecting Tripitaka on his, I should say, our quest, I see that I was less interested in disrupting than I was in arriving where I wasn't allowed, attaining what I didn't yet have, and becoming what I wasn't supposed to be. All constraints bothered me, but all were related to the one great restraint that I couldn't endure, mortality. My adventures truly began when I said to myself, if we die, shall we not have lived in vain? At this, Odysseus spoke up. Wukong, my friend, we seem so very much alike, heroic warriors, even though I'm a man and you're a monkey. We both see constraints as an invitation to use, expand, or escape them as we seek to gain victory and glory. The one thing I don't understand is your desire to live and stay young forever. You know, I was once offered immortality by the nymph Calypso, who, as you can see, by the way, was gorgeous and turned her down. Mortality, after all, is necessary for life not to be in vain. It's our advantage over the immortal gods who can't match the intensity of our joys or sorrows. You see, death is the limitation, the good constraint that makes glory possible. We have only so many opportunities to win victories or avenge insults. Otherwise, we're in the midst of a race with no finish line. Have I forever to catch up or relinquish my lead? How can I celebrate a victory? Will Kong look thoughtful? You make a point I hadn't considered, Odysseus. He said, though you've also created another category, hero, that doesn't fit me. In a strange way, and one that will surprise you, at the same time, it does still occasionally fit me. As you spoke, I realized that to some degree, I once fully embraced the values that you say guide you, competition, vengeance, the desire for personal triumph and glory. Immortality and power were united in my mind. So I sought out the great master Subhuti out of those desires. I learned from him to harmonize the three ways for immediate power, but not as a path to elusive wisdom. I left with awesome power, but not the wisdom, since I had no goals beyond my own or to protect my little monkey tribe. Odysseus replied, in that way you and I at that point in your life, at least, were very much alike. My view of life is clear. I seek personal greatness through bold, decisive action, and best if one in circumstances of grave danger. My world is an, is an arena of competition for advantage over one another. The world in which I live is overseen, if, if that's the right word, overseen capriciously by self-interested gods who have the same basic ethic that I described as mine. They, like me, recognize only victories and defeat. The only people I truly value are my beloved Penelope, my son Telemachus, and those of my kingdom who are loyal to me. But now we differ, said Wukong. 
Yes, I once thought just like you. Yes, the Jade Emperor and his entourage seem just like the gods you describe. I like your word, capricious. But now I see there is a cosmic order, a morality embedded in the universe. What changed your outlook, asked Odysseus? The wager with the Buddha? and the discovery of a vastness that placed my challenge of limits in a new perspective. But that leads me back to Dennis's question. No, the years under the mountain were neither dreadful nor a silence to be endured. They were a gift that provided time for introspection. I realized that I'd been applying all my energies to please me, and that was the emptiness that I finally had time to awaken to. As I sat beneath that mountain, I see in retrospect, I was indeed what you would call a hero. But a hero, from your perspective, assumes a universe without purpose or moral design. Once that design is recognized, heroism, to use your term, must evolve into something else, something larger. Well, in a world of larger meaning, asked Odysseus, what is the hero? A demon, strange to say, replied Wukong. The demon has appealing powers darkened by an appalling attitude. He values self-promotion over public welfare, is concerned with worldly goods and recognition, and he indulges in deceitful transformations to achieve his self-interested goals. The demon, to put it mildly, has not realized the necessity of submitting the self to a larger self that is the cosmic order. But the energy still flowed through and within me, all the while gathering strength should an opportunity appear. The monk Tripitaka's invitation to join him in acquiring and transporting sacred scriptures was that opportunity. So, laughed Odysseus, now I am a demon? I fear I will remain one. And my demonic nature, if you will, prompts one more question. Tripitaka freed you from confinement. Good. He offered you an opportunity for action. Good. But then he placed around your head, I see it with my own eyes, a golden band. Dennis said he used, says that he uses it to control you. When he chants the proper spell, it causes you unbearable pain. True? If so, how could you submit to that? Ha! <laughs> you should talk, laughed the Wukong. You, who sat within the bowels of a wooden horse, among the weapons and smell belonging to dozens of rank warriors. You who allowed yourself to be tied tight to your ship's mast so you could hear the sirens sing their seductions. You, who endured the stink and rags and bros and insults while disguised as a beggar. All temporary hardships, useful as always, for you to reach some goal. This tightening chain, he continued, is much the same for me. A constraint that in fact helps me to achieve my larger goal. It serves to warn me when I regress back to my demon selfishness. It reminds me not to be what once I was, but to become what I still yearn to be. Here is the difference that now I see. Did your journey take you more than home? I doubt it. My quest is only in part to bring scriptures from India to China. My quest is also to bring me upward to enlightenment. Perhaps I am a monkey on my way to becoming human or a monkey human becoming a sage. Perhaps humanness is but a stage before I become something that needs no more reminders. Then the Buddha will, I hope, remove that tightening band or it might disappear. But you will remain constrained, I fear, by that heroic outlook you described, your need to win, to hear your praises sung. Your words both trouble and please me, replied Odysseus. What I have be become, uh, he said to Odysseus, 
what I have become that transmates mere heroism, Odysseus replied, is an artist. I weave stories, not only to deceive, but also to enchant. To tell such stories, I must create within other constraints the rules of how to tell the tale. Yes, exclaimed Wukong, in deeper ways, we are the same, both constrained and not constrained, both something and something else at the same time. Above all, we're never still, always at a threshold of change. Are you a hero disguised as a beggar? A beggar pretending to be a hero? A hero seeking fame? A storyteller granting it? Are you the storyteller or the story? Obviously, enjoying this marriage of sensibilities, Odysseus replied, even when not in disguise or crammed into a horse or trapped in a cave, I always made certain that I was never just one thing, but always multiple, myself and myself incognito, myself and myself in disguise, or myself known to me, but simultaneously known to the other only through a carefully concocted false tale. Of course, to the idiot Cyclops, I was myself, I was myself but <laughs> nobody to him. That was both a trick and the beginning of a great pun. The Greek word for nobody can become the same as the Greek word for cleverness. It was also the cause of many pains for me, I must admit. But I had to reveal I was the hero or for you the demon who fooled him. For the demon hero, an anonymous victory is no victory at all. His protector, the god Poseidon, did take long and nasty vengeance on me. But as for you, my simian philosopher, he asked in return, when you battle demons, are you a monkey or a demon, demon or pilgrim? If you become a sage, will that end your transformations? Better, I say, to pause when you become a man and learn to embrace mortality. Wu Kong replied, well, what's a man? Perhaps we'll learn someday that men were once monkeys, perhaps even a defective offspring. Is man one of your beloved categories? Does it describe the way you look or the way you act? Odysseus, this is how I see the world. A place like us, never still, always changing, always about to be something else, where categories dull as well as shed the light of understanding. At that, Odysseus laughed. Well said, dear friend. Now I know what truly joins us. Perhaps I too am but a stage in some vast change that I don't recognize. Well said, a different voice suddenly exclaimed. That is precisely what you are. The gentleman who'd been sitting in the far corner drinking wine had joined us, and I recognized Aeneas. Odysseus is right, as Dennis said to begin this lecture, said Aeneas, but not quite as he thinks. You see, he represents an incomplete version of the heroic, a stage in its evolution of Western thought. The history in Western culture indeed can best be understood as a continuous attempt to domesticate the heroic outlook that drives Odysseus. Sun Wukong, let me introduce myself. I am Odysseus, the next stage in evolution. That change like your transformation was the outcome of the discovery or maybe invention of a morally ordered universe. My life kind of parallels yours. I had the same values of Odysseus, Combat, vengeance, glory. I would have died gladly at Troy and with that warring death gained glory. But it turns out that there is an order and I was destined not to leave the burning city with my father and son to found Rome and its empire. I never lost my heroic outlook, but had to subordinate my desires to a loftier ideal. Whenever I did so, my name became Aeneas the pious, Aeneas, the duty bound. Piety, duty, was the version of the tightening chain around my spirit 
whenever I regress to heroic values. Both Odysseus and Wukong were intrigued by this turn of events and new direction for the conversation. They asked Aeneas to tell them how this evolution would play out. I can't say for sure, he said, but it's been prophesied that there will arise two transformative developments, both associated with the Aeneid. The state will absorb into itself the heroic ethic, seeing the world as an arena of conflict and competition, seeing glory and taking vengeance on its enemies. This attitude will prevail, but be challenged by the rise of a new religion that assumes a morally order ordered cosmos created by a compassionate deity. This religion will try to foster a different set of values, life as an altruistic quest, humility, and forgiveness. Western culture, I'm told, will derive its dynamic energy from constant attempts to integrate these two essentially incompatible ethical outlooks. Both looked intrigued. Then in a sense, Odysseus said, and Wukong nodded, both China and the West will in the future both seek within themselves to harmonize the same apparent conflict of demons, uh, either pilgrims, or form some new kind of heroic behavior. Yes, replied Aeneas, and perhaps in ways that neither can foresee. I fear that too often, as your friend Wukong, that version of Voltaire observed a constricted attitude on either side will lead to conflict rather than harmony. A fascinating question worth further explanation. But the hour had grown late, the sky dark, the restaurant about to close, and the bill still to be paid. My guests had to depart, but we agreed to continue our conversation. We also agreed that we needed to expand the circle of those invited and involved. Our conversation, though wide ranging, had been constrained in part by the presence only of men. After all, both Odysseus and Wu Kong had succeeded only with the guidance of women, Gan Yin, Athena, Penelope. We must embrace their wise perspective, the wisdom, too, of stories and storytellers from India and elsewhere, others who could speak of the religious views that Aeneas mentioned. The dinner finished. My fascinating friends gone. I walked home. Once home, I tried to remember the conversation as accurately as possible. As often happened, one idea stuck in my mind. The hero of one culture is another's demon. And the counterpart, the demon of one culture, is another's hero. Each represents the continuing attempt to harmonize, or from the heroic perspective, to struggle with the relation of the individual to society and societies with one another. I see a continuum. On one end, the self-absorbed primacy of self-interest, and on the other, of self-dissolving group success. Both extremes, each in its own way, seem to me destructive. What and under what conditions lie the cords to resolve that dissonance? It's no secret that the world that we once thought might well become a global village is fragmenting, turning inward. Dations, politics, religions, even education. Even worse, isolated within the comfort of our walled-in fragment our solidified category, we grow more certain that I'm right and you're wrong. I'm righteous and therefore you are dangerous. I'm a hero, you must be a demon. As Wu Kong implied, it is dispiriting, harmful, and infuriating to be viewed as a defective version of what the other would like you to be. This cannot go on. Disagreement does not necessarily imply a threat. We must widen the circle of those whom we hear and deepen the reservoir of ideas that we are willing to integrate into our vision of the world. Universities must expand our role, returning to the more embracing vision of education that prepares the student for more than mere success, that nurtures in students and ourselves a love of learning and a quest for meaningful wisdom. To fill this aspiration, universities throughout the world must embrace our responsibility to value and nurture science, 
and learning and international understanding through the arts and the humanities. The process is not all that daunting. To begin with, we must seek out and hear each other's stories. I started by quoting an American and a Chinese storyteller. Remember their words, Joyce Carol Oates, stories enable us to slip into another skin, another's voice, another soul, to enter a consciousness not known to us. You are, we can tap the mysterious power of storytelling to communicate with someone of a different time, a different country, a different race, a different language, and a different culture, and through stories there encounter a sensation that is our very own. The Center for Asian Studies exists to help our students, our university community, and the greater communities that surround us to harmonize the world's multiple ways and search for mutually beneficent ways to make the world's next stories more enchanting. I hope that some of you who hear this presentation will join and support our quest. The possibilities are, well, boundless. Thank you very much for your attention. If there are any comments or questions, you have, you could have typed them into the chat uh, or speak them. Uh, Olivia Kong, to whom I must also express my thanks for her brilliant te technical support and choice of visuals. Uh, I see Ted Harpum. Ted. Hello, Dennis. I have a question. Nice yeah. speech. I really enjoyed it. But I tend to think as a political scientist and a political philosopher, the heroic in the Western tradition can be very dangerous to public peace and public tranquility. Does, oh. the, monkey, does the monkey king have the same problem? <laughs> I, uh, I, I hope that when I talked about a new and different form of heroism, uh, Ted knows that I spent most of my adult life studying the concept of heroic excellence. And I happen to agree uh, with Ted that uh, there's an innate contradiction in heroic leadership, for example. The goal should be the prosperity and the health and the opportunities of the people. But if the leader is a hero and interested in self-glory, then you diminish what you can do for others. No, I agree, Ted. Uh, heroism, if in the sense of a modified Virgilian heroism, may be the best that we can hope for. It's my, it's my understanding of the West that the heroic impulse is embedded uh, within our consciousness in a sense. What about the Chinese impulse then, the, the monkey king side of your talk? <laughs> Well, you know, China and everything I say begins with a declaration of my full ignorance and the minimal nature of my knowledge of Asia. Remember, China ha is westernizing and communism as a form of government is basically a Western idea because it's based on struggle and conflict across, ca across classes rather than harmonizing. Uh, I believe China and the United States are engaged, if they think about it, in the same desire to harmonize the role of the individual with the responsibilities to society. Uh, I believe if the two countries are to grow out of and see beyond immediate conflicts, they together could find a way to harmonize the pilgrim and the saint. Um, the three ways of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism with the three ways, if you will, of the Abrahamic religions uh, to form, I still believe, something extraordinary and to help us become more fully human. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else? Uh, I guess uh, Frank Zhu, I recognize that name. Hello, Frank. How are you? Hello. Unmute yourself, my friend.
Uh, okay, Frank is having trouble. Dashwan Feng, where, where, did you have your hand up? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, any any other questions or or comments? Olivia, any typed in? I'm I'm delighted that I always consider uh, silence complete approbation and approval. That's how I've made it through my life. Ted. Well, I'll come back. Uh I think your comparison of figures like this is absolutely fascinating and spinning a narrative out. You could see something like this very much with a Confucian perspective, with uh, a St. Francis perspective, for example, or uh, a Confucius perspective and a Platonic perspective. We've talked about that before with Plato or Socrates, how they're grappling with similar problems, but maybe going in different directions as they think about it. Uh, intriguing. I'm sure you've got the same thing going on with India. Uh, interesting ways to have mm -hmm. the development of cross-cultural ideas and not just talking about Huawei and Microsoft and sort of getting to more to more deeper, deeper things. Yeah. I believe strongly as an educator that we need to tell each other more stories. Uh, stories are, after all, really the primary way that we day-to-day -day, uh, uh, exchange information, uh, introduce ourselves, um, entertain ourselves. Wait, I, I, someone was speaking. I don't know who it was, but, <laughs> but yeah, Ted, I think, again, reading stories is important, but stories provide this possibility of exercising the imagination as well. Uh, remember, uh, it's now a cliche that the theory of relativity in some sense ultimately goes back to Albert Einstein imagining himself riding a light beam. Mm -hmm. uh, so, And science, as also Einstein emphasized, is a combination of analytical, logical, with imaginative, associative thinking. Uh, I would like to see more of us spend more time uh, trying to combine those two modes of thought, the logical analytic and the imaginative associative uh, to, to solve problems, to answer issues. Uh, Dennis, this is Anwar Zakidov. Anwar, I, hello. I want first of all congratulate you that you expanded Confucius Institute to Center of Asian Studies. <laughs> this is phenomenal. I will tell you why. Because I am part of Asia, which is not China, <laughs> but it is Central Asia. It's a big region on the Silk Road. <laughs> it was always interface between East and West. And right. somehow they adjusted and they have their own history and philosophy. Maybe looking at that at Persia. Mawera Nahar, Samarkand, Bukhara, the great poets like Omar Khayyam and uh, Jalaluddin Rumi is another way to think about heroes and demons. Uh, yes. Well, you know, Anwar, one of the first things I discovered was it's impossible to find the wall separating Asia from Europe. Uh, there seems to be no no sharp moment when Asia and Europe become different. Um, I also know that the most exciting, you know, the most fertile part of the waters is the estuary where the salt water and the fresh water mix. That's where <laughs> life abounds. I think of joining Asia and Western thought, both of which are complex beings, as creating a kind of estuary where new thoughts can occur. Um, so thank you, yeah, I, I appreciate, I appreciate your, your words on that. Uh, rumor has it that Russia is uh, one of those liminal nations that is both Asian and European. It is, it is Euro-Asian. And um, I'm glad my voice is back, you know, I did a surgery, what? so I cannot speak too loudly as before. 
but I want to say that uh, this is so important, particularly now in pandemic time, when our country is uh, in some sort of crisis. Because the concept of, you know, individual success in business, making money, may be conflicting with the idea to save a society. Yes. That's yeah. why maybe China was more successful to fight with pandemic. And countries in Europe like Denmark, who are more social and they are not like America, wild capitalism approach of individual hero like Trump. The best like response to the is with money is, is uh, something important. The best response is the mixed response. But of course, my talks are always completely apolitical. Uh, Dashwan Feng uh, has, has raised his hand. Dashwan, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. OK. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, truly exciting uh, talk. And I also want to echo Anwar's uh, comment about congratulating the transition of the Confucius Institute into the Center for Asian Studies. I think that um, while the Confucius Institute is an exciting endeavor, uh, now it really opens up the possibilities that, uh, that, that the whole world can come to CAS. Um, my, it's not a question, maybe it's just a comment and, and you might, you, I, I like to hear your comment. It, it's to me that very interesting that uh, you mentioned already there is no de there is no separation between Western, namely Europe, and Asia. In fact, it's one big piece of land, uh, and um, and in between uh, there is vast emptiness. Although yes. there are places like Uzbekistan where Anwar came from, uh, but still the population is very very sparse. So for some reason, uh, we have decided to think of Europe as, as a continent and Asia as another continent. And what is really interesting, and you have already, basically your theme is that on this large piece of land where Europe and Asia is, there are two Western way of thinking and the Eastern way of thinking. And, and they that dominate the whole world at the moment, these two thinkings. Mm -hmm. Is there, from your discussion, are you suggesting that these two thinkings can actually create a new way of thinking? Because the current ways of thinking, either in the Western sense or the Eastern sense, are not solving our our you know our, our absolute mit uh, uh, absolute challenges global warming and so on. We need new thinkings. By putting these two Eastern and Western ways together, can we find new solutions to problems that we are not solving now? Uh, uh, thanks, Dashwan. That, you know, I've spent my entire career, the part of it at UT Dallas, coming to UT Dallas introduced me to the true power of convergence that if we keep, if we say there's scientists think X and artists and humanists think Y, we, that's Snow's old outmoded version of the two cultures. We will stay locked in inadequate thinking. True genius comes, as the psychologist, psychologist Jerome Bruner told us that there are two basic ways of thinking, the logical, analytical, and the associative, imaginative, Together, they are more powerful. Those who know me know that my favorite scientific concept is torque. Two forces meeting at the proper angle increase the total force of each to something far more important and powerful. That's how I see the union of Western and Eastern thought. And it's already happening, Dashwan, our Asian American students, our American students who go to Asia, you encounter another world, another reality. You must think differently to survive. Traveling in Asia transformed no small part of my thinking. And that's, that's exactly what I 
Uh, and I didn't say it. Uh, the monkey king said it. And he's so much smarter than I am when he said the problem with Western thinking is categories. We create a category and stick you in it. And then you can only exist within that category. If you think of a continuum, you can you have no bounds, no limits to where you can go to the new ideas that you can have. I would like to get rid of the concept of Western and Asian thinking ultimately and have there be a new kind of thinking along a continuum which at its best blends the what we think of are the most productive aspects of what we now see as separate separate worlds. Uh, there's someone that I see another hand up in the in the list of people who are Frank Zhu. There you go, Frank. And there are there are two more with hands up. Let me see if I can uh, find them. Yes, Frank, how are you doing? Hi, Dr. Kratz. Now, can you hear me? I can hear you now. OK, good. Thank you so much. And so sorry about the technical difficulties earlier. Um, so I guess what what was going to be a spontaneous question I've now typed into the chat. Um, so I'm now reading off of it, but I guess I'd love to revisit the characterization of the monkey king's chain as, uh, in quote, a constraint from the demonic self, end quote. Uh, but there are points in the journey, uh, there are points uh, in the journey of the West where the chain limits the monkey king, even when he acts in the interest of the monk, right? The tale Sanda Bai Wu Jing, white bone, the, like the tale of the white bone demon is an example of this. And so is the chain then a constraint from Wu Kong's demonic self, as much as it is a testament to the limitations of the the monk's awareness or assessment of particular circumstances, and how does this uh, sort of understanding of the chain and the constraint of the monkey king integrate into um, the Odysseus and monkey king? Okay, thanks, Frank. I'll answer this, and then I, I, happily there are other people too. Uh, Frank, I see this as again see see the monkey king on a continuum. There's the monkey king early in his life who is pretty much a demon. Then there's um, there's the Monkey King, who at the end reaches enlightenment. In the meantime, he is on the continuum of mixed being. Uh, let me get the analogy I would give you since he is a monkey, is that we as human beings are not on a scale ever of being, quote, fully human. We are continuously also part of our animal selves as we continuously act. Oh, there, there's another conversation I'd like to have about the inability of the Western imagination to think positively of animals the way the Asian imagination does. Think of Sun Wukong, think of Hanuman as brilliant, sophisticated, very human monkeys. And the best the Western imagination could come up with is King Kong. Uh, let me go now to to Jan Lee, who's had her hand hand up. Hi, John. It's good to see you. You're you're on now. Jan, unmute yourself. I, yes. Hi, hi, Dennis. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, in the chat box, I wrote reminded me of Campbell's discussion on heroes' journeys, and I think uh, Campbell's work on heroes' journeys illustrate perfectly well the two. Uh, examples that you uh, give us, because deep down, um, deep down, the the um, the heroes all share the same traits. They they um, they they have ambition. They struggle. They suffer, and they overcome, yeah. um, and they achieve some kind of greatness. So deep down, that kind of pattern uh, is shared. I yeah, I partly agree, Jan, but uh, the trouble is that um, Campbell's is so general. Right. That, uh, right. Too many things might, might fit into it. Uh, it's a good point. Thank you. Nami Koska, who uh, is a professor at UTD. Nami, hello. Unmute Hi. Uh, <laughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, it was great. Um, the presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Chris. I was really looking for this moment. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so and uh, yes, I teach Japanese and I'm Japanese. I grew up with the uh, Monkey King and a TV Japanese version. And I love that show. And so and that makes me kind of really um, to kind of think um, I when um, 
books. Yeah, I read the books too um, in Japanese. <laughs> Monkey King is very famous in Japan. Um, it was great, and I really agree that um, those uh, the cons uh, the concept of the um, the, he um, the he he hero heroism. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, I'm <laughs> um, those. It was very interesting that uh, those uh, the compare or just to meet the Odysseus and Monkey King together. I really didn't know that what happened, but those actually that um, that's great that actually those the, uh, the concept of a human being and what is the, um, the good thing and what it makes it the heroism. Actually, that's actually the common, you know, uh, the, what I think human being, um, that's a basic concept of what human being uh, have and what what the life's for, or what you are living for, actually yeah. that mm -hmm, through the time, through that um, the countries, it doesn't matter the Western or Japan. Actually, what people want and to live for is actually the same purpose. Yeah. I think. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think it was great, and uh, I just wanted to say thank you so you much. You know, it was a great uh, presentation. <laughs> oh, there's. The concept, and by the way, speaking of constraints, the um, the constraint we have is time, and I will time for just Dashwan. I see has had his hand up again for one last one last comment or question from from my. Uh, I, I, I'm very pleased to end with Dashwan in the sense for the questions because Dashwan was the man who first took me to China, and introduced me to Asia. So Dashwan, uh, a word from you. Uh, actually, I was just thinking, how would you CAS carry out this this really complicated and difficult journey? <laughs> what a perfect last comment. The journey has just begun. Uh, the center is one year old. We're going to accomplish. Well, we're I don't ever want to accomplish the goal. I want to keep after a receding goal, if you will. We will be offering international seminars, international conferences, uh, which by the way, one advantage of this new remote world is it's easier to, to gather people internationally than it ever has been. We will sponsor programming that not only tries to bring Asian and Americans together, but to try to bring Asians and Americans together who are dealing with the same issue so that the Westerners can hear the issue dealt with from the Asian perspective and the Asians from the American perspective. I think, Dashwan, it was you who pointed out to me once that most of what Americans know about Asia and China and India, they know from American authors. And probably too much of what Asians know about America they know about from Asian authors or American popular culture. Uh, I, I think we must use the stories of each other's cultures and have programming based upon telling and listening and more than interpreting, but to try to become enchanted by each other's stories. We will create new programming. We will above all listen to advice. So I will end with an open call for advice, for suggestions, for support, and for anyone interested to become an affiliated member of the Center for Asian Studies. We have an international advisory board whose membership stretches from Dallas to Edinburgh to uh, India uh, to China. Um, right now, our goal as I've said, if the Monkey King and Odysseus can get together and have dinner and a conversation and discover, though the Monkey King rails at it, that deep down, we're all members of the same fraternity, the fraternity of mortality. That gives us only so much time, so many opportunities, to cease disliking each other and to begin understanding each other. Uh, next speaker, by the way, is the wondrous Nami Kraska,
who will speak about the ways that we can learn more about Asia and China and other and Japan in particular through popular culture such as uh, manga and anime. Uh, I have to say uh, in my Asian studies class last uh, this week, uh, thanks to thanks to Nami, I now not only about K-pop but J-pop. And if you don't know what it is, you need to come with us and learn more about Jap about Asian culture. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Olivia Khan, for managing this event and for your brilliant work helping me put the talk together. We'll see you next month for Nami Kraska. Please contact me personally if you have any questions. Bye for now. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. It's 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 yeah. gonna be November. November seventh. Nope. November. Nami Kraska. Yes. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Please contact me. Bye bye.